Okay, good evening ladies and gentlemen, welcome to City Circle. Salaam alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. This week saw the, uh, the longest junior doctor strike that we've seen so far in the, uh, the dispute between... Uh, <laughs> I think it's going to be the earliest round of applause that we've ever had in the City Circle. <laughs> well, half, halfway through the chair's first sentence. Um, it's, um, it was the first 48 hour walkout um, as part of the uh, junior doctors uh, dispute with the government um, and that obviously represents new low in the, uh, the dispute which doesn't seem as though it's going to be resolved any time particularly soon. Um, in total, um, the Guardian reported that over 5,000 um, procedures and operations were disrupted and had to be cancelled. Um, the dispute's obviously over paying conditions um, the government's been elected on a promise to deliver a seven-day NHS service and an expanded service um, on running seven days a week. Um, and that's obviously going to involve changing the working practices if the government's going to meet its own sort of fiscal and budgetary targets. On the other side, the BMA, the British Medical Association, which is the doctors' trade union, um, says that the new contract and the changes are unfair, um, and they've even gone so far as to say that they're unsafe. Um, they obviously involve um, the part of the dispute runs over um, the active hours or sorry antisocial hours and um, sort of premiums that doctors have been paid up until now and the differences and the differences under the new contract which has sort of recently been imposed on them. Um, both sides are obviously arguing that patient safety is sort of being put in jeopardy by the other. Um, the government says that the strikes are unsafe um, and the doctors say that the conditions that they're going to have to operate under and under. So who's right? Um, that's, what, that's part of at least what we're here to uh, discuss tonight. And we've got a panel of three doctors um, working in some different capacities at different uh, stages in their career. Um, Dr. Nazia Khan, um, who on my, uh, my left, is an anaesthetic registrar in her final year of training. Um, Dr. Anna Livingston on the uh, on the end there um, is a GP in Tower Hamlet, and uh, Dr. Shabnam Parker um, is a paediatric surgeon at Great Ormond Street Hospital. Please give them a very warm welcome. Okay, so for those of you not familiar with City Circle, um, the general format this evening is that each of the speakers is going to have about 10 minutes or so to address sort of different aspects of, um, of their thoughts and background to. Uh, the dispute. I think Dr. Lewis is going to talk about um, sort of the NHS and the sort of wider context and reforms going on there. Um, and then we're going to open this up to you, the audience. Um, and that's really what this is, this is all about. I think, although I haven't heard uh, sort of what three speakers have to say yet, um, I think we can probably imagine that they're going to have similar messages and similar thoughts. Um, so a large part of the evening really comes down to how you challenge them and pick up on some of the things that they're going to be saying. Um, and at the same time, I'll obviously sort of pick up on um, some of the thoughts that are coming back to us. Um, as always uh, with our talks, um, if you're on Twitter, um, whether you're here or not, you can follow um, parts of the discussion. Um, our, uh, our handle is at the City Circle, and you'll be able to sort of follow the stream of tweets sort of from tonight um, using the hashtag CCTalk. So if you've got particular thoughts or comments, um, you can either tweet those sort of during the talk or afterwards. Okay. Um, so our first speaker this evening is uh, Dr. Anna Livingston. Um, Anna graduated from the London Hospital, which is now uh, Barnes and London, in 1978, after which she worked 120 hours a week um, in the hospital. Um, I think everyone would be glad to hear those kind of contracts in her number around. And um, since 1983, she's practiced as a GP in Tower Hamlets, where she's an active member of the local general practice community, as well as being a teacher and trainer. Um, she's on the, she's the clinical lead for the Town Hamlet's clinical uh, commissioning group. She's particularly interested in addressing inequality in health. Uh, she's campaigned for and helped, um, deliver, helped develop uh, bilingual advocacy and support services. And she's also a volunteer medical legal uh, report writer for Freedom from Torture. She's active in her local BM, BMA and Unite branches and as a secretary of the Town Hamlet's Keep Our NHS Public. Hello, over to you. Hello, I've got quite a loud voice if this um, stops working. This morning, I and another Keeper NHS public supporter 
were leafleting outside the tube station in Whitechapel because today a bill has been put in front of Parliament for its second reading, the NHS reinstatement bill. Because this government and its predecessor under Lansley uh, produced the Health and Social Care Act which was enacted, which came into being in, in 2013, enacted in 2012, which removed people's right to use NHS services and set the stage more strongly than ever before for privatisation and exclusion. Now, so many people campaigning for the health service feel that we definitely need to reinstate the NHS not likely legally at the moment with the present government, but there were big rallies in Westminster today for the NHS. While we were handing out leaflets, and this is a place where we've been supporting the junior doctors over the last months, while we were handing out leaflets, a woman came up to me who was probably seven or eight years older than me. She was supplementing her pension by going to invigilate medical students because she only had pension, she told me. And she rushed up to me and she said, you must give me one of these. We need to have the NHS that Bevan brought about back. People don't seem to remember that before the NHS, people couldn't afford to see the doctor. My grandparents couldn't afford to take my parents to the doctor and it was only with the NHS that I could go to the doctor. When the NHS started, it was wanted by both the bosses and the workers. People were unfit. So they didn't work very effectively. And people couldn't afford health care. And in the East End, things were very severe. And this particular woman, unfortunately, had an East End GP who was telling her that people ought to spend £10 on their appointments to encourage them to come to their appointments. And she said, how do you think I can afford that out of my state pension? So there are many people out there. She's a very good example of the kind of people who need the NHS. The NHS has been chipped away at over the years. It's always been underfunded. It's currently one of the least funded health services in Europe. We have fewer beds than most other developed countries. And yet we deliver excellent service and outcomes that are better than most of them. And all the evidence is that increased inequality in communities leads to worse outcomes in health. And that means testing of services and benefits, including health services, lead to less take up by those most in need. The health service, as it has been conceived, providing publicly a service for everyone in the public of a high quality, and I think the same applies to education, is the best way of providing the health service input of what we need to have a healthy society, healthy emotionally and physically. Of course, health services are only a small part of health. However, the NHS was underfunded, was created rather messily with various deals with the BMA and, and med medical profession. There was no proper funding put in as the post-war government began to run out of money because wars were started in Korea and so on. Uh, they put in charges for um, prescriptions. Old Victorian hospitals were crumbling all over the place and not replaced even in times of boom. And then we got to this situation where, which we now have, where a huge amount of money is being spent on private finance initiative hospitals. And we have the most expensive in Whitechapel, uh, which is now part of Bart's Health across right out to Whips Cross. This hospital cost of just over a billion pounds to build. We all, including the GPs, were very against it being built because we felt the Treasury should fund this. And instead of that, they took out um, a deal with a number of private companies. And so the hospital that's cost one, just over a billion to build will cost over seven billion to repay with debts for our health economy uh, over the next 30, 40 years. This is extremely serious, and this year, the Royal London Hospital and Bar Bart's Health, which is the conglomerate including it, are supposed to have had a deficit of 93 million, are actually coming in for a deficit somewhere about 170 million. It isn't working, morale is terrible. They've been trying to save money by downgrading nurses who've then left. They 
um, sacked a whistleblower at Whip's Cross who was reinstated after a tribunal. And uh, the junior doctor's um, case across England is actually part of the same financial constraints on people who work within the NHS and on the services there. So here we have a building in Whitechapel which has fewer beds than ever before and we have fewer hospital beds than ever before in England and we also have fewer than anyone else in Europe. And we haven't got the money to pay the staff. There are all the secondary problems of morale and so on. We haven't got the money to deliver the care. And the health service, including the money spent for these private, uh, private uh, facilities, is being, um, is, is being grossly underfunded. So it's not true that it's not affordable to fund our health service properly. For a start, we shouldn't be spending this money on mortgages and private companies and other people's profits. And other areas include the pharmaceutical industry, which rates in a huge amount from NH the NHS. But we shouldn't have a system in the NHS which allows money which we think in the publicity by the government is going to our healthcare when it's not at all. The NHS is now in major crisis. Fewer people are joining to be doctors, nurses are leaving, staff are leaving, people are being sacked and downgraded. And it's absolutely important that we stand together as the people in this country saying we need a safe health service. And the junior doctor's fight is part of this. It's not a fight of greed. It's a fight for safety, adequate conditions, and actually for recruitment. In the practice where I work in Limehouse, we've lost so much money through government cuts that they can't recruit anyone because nobody wants to come and work for that level of money. When I was a young doctor, when I was a medical student in the 1970s, there was a doctor's strike. That doctor's strike was by the consultants. And it was really, a lot of it was support was around their right to continue to do individual private practice. So it was a very um, you know, dubious sort of strike. In the 19, we worked all these long hours, but we were not strong and united enough, and also we were working so many hours, to organize to reduce our unsafe hours. But I and my colleagues were so exhausted that we couldn't stay awake when we weren't at work, and people posted to jobs out of the area who had to drive back. People had accidents, there were people committing suicide. Not that people don't still commit suicide, but there was a really terrible situation. People are still extremely tired, and we, in many ways, didn't work as intensively because the technology wasn't as intensive. But it was a terrible situation, and it took us until about 1989, 1990, when I was fully absorbed in general practice, really, for particularly our local one of our local doctors, Dr. Now, Sir Sam Everington, and other local doctors, including Dr. Jackie Appleby, the chair of our local BMA, were there campaigning as part of the BMA's very junior doctors. Sam had a kind of sleep in outside the London hospital, as well as being a national BMA figure. And that, that all this activity led to, it was not a strike, it was, pro, it was protests at that time, but this activity led to a rather better contract not perfect in any way, but now we're in a situation where that is desperately under, under attack. If you value the service you need, and if you value the service your family need, and older people like me will need increasingly as we are older, you need to think about how you can defend the NHS, and that involves defending the NHS workers. And I was proud to be with my granddaughter, who's three months old, my daughter, who's a teacher with granddaughter in the plan, my sister-in-law and my husband, who are local GPs in Tower Hamlets as I am, on the demonstration yesterday, supporting the junior hospitals from the Royal Hospital in Whitechapel through to St Paul's Cathedral. And there were many people from trades unions. There was even the um, president of the Baker's Union saying, we depend on the health service. You, are, you and we are there together. And that's really important. And also there was, there was a fire brigade, there was somebody from um, ASLEF, a, a senior official, possibly a president, I never remember what people's offices were, but what was interesting as well, the train drivers, of course, you know, they're always, be, if you read the evening standard, they're these evildoers disrupting transport, but they have many of the same issues about working hours. It's very bad for us to be working shifts, but we have to in medicine. But they have to be worked in such a way that it is social. And it's the same with the, with the train drivers. 
We've always provided a seven-day NHS. This is complete rubbish from the government. The government's plan is to wear us all down so that we're all cheap labourers providing poor quality care so that a privatised system can provide factory health care for the poor and a small number of the well-insured wealthy can go off to better facilities. This is not okay and this is why I support the junior doctors. Okay, thank you very much for that, Baron. Um, we're going to uh, we're going to sort of move straight on to our, our next speaker. So if that sort of provoked thoughts and uh, ideas in your mind, sort of make a mental note of them. We'll, uh, we'll sort of come back to uh, come back to your thoughts sort of in the Q and A. Um, our next speaker tonight is Nazia Khan. Um, Nazia is um, an anaesthetic registrar in her final year of training. She graduated in two thousand and six from Bath's <coughs> and the London School of Medicine and Dentistry. She completed her foundation training in London before starting her anaesthetic career with the East of England Deanery. In 2013, she gained a fellowship for the Royal College, for the Royal College of Anaesthetists and is currently working at Adel Brooks Hospital in Cambridge. In August, she hopes to embark on a one-year fellowship with the University College Hospital in London. She's now been travelling and recently, com recently combined work and her passion for travel in a three-month fellowship in paediatric anaesthesia in Uganda. Nazia, over to you. Thank you. Um, and I just want to say thank you to Dr. Livingston. The final point she made about privatisation, I think, is really the key take-home message for from this entire talk and the junior doctor strike. Um, I'm going to speak today about how junior doctors are currently uh, paid, the salary scale, the banding, which I think is confusing sometimes to the public and uh, the government plays on that uh, to misrepresent the facts. So uh, we're going to start by just explaining how training works for junior doctors and then how that's reflected in their salary and in banding. So doctors are paid on a national pay scale uh, and this is determined by a doctors and dentists review body. Uh, which gives evidence from the BMA, the UK uh, Health Department and NHS employers uh, and reports to the Secretary of State with recommendations of how to set the pay scale. And so depending on what your level of training is will determine what your basic salary is. Um, and each year the BMA will publish uh, the basic salary pay scale. So training for uh, UK doctors is starts with foundation training. Uh, once you leave medical school, uh, you embark on a two-year foundation training programme uh, and then after that you apply for your subspecialty. And subspecialty can vary from GP, which is a three-year training programme, to surgical training programmes, which, which are eight years. I'm an anaesthetist, mine is a seven-year training programme. And this is therefore reflected in our basic salary uh, and each year we have an increment and we essentially go up the ladder. So I just wanted to show the slide for uh, basic pay. So I hope everyone can see this. This is what our basic salary is. So it starts at foundation training. Now some people end up doing more years than are necessary at foundation level, at core training level, or at specialty registrar level. And you each year, each year of service, you go up the pay scale. The key point about basic pay right now is that there's no going down the ladder. It's reflective of your years of service to the NHS. It's not reflective of your uh, of your training, where you are in your training. So what I mean by that is that if tomorrow I decided to go into general practice uh, and I wanted to start my general practice training, I wouldn't go down the pay scale. I wouldn't go back to core training pay scale. I would continue at my current basic pay because I have committed 10 years of training of service to the NHS. And so that's one key point that has changed with the new contract which Shubham is going to speak about. <coughs> now, the next issue uh, is of banding. So, 
we are all paid a basic salary, but on top of that, um, we have something called banding, which is the, the aim is to sort of remunerate doctors fairly according to the actual hours they work and the frequency of out-of-hour work that they, that they do. It also covers things like regular commitments like early start, which perhaps aren't quite taken into the hours that they work, or teaching and, the, and extra hours that they have to do here and there just to cover lists or to the additional work that just needs to be done on the ward. And so the banding is according to this. So it starts at band three, which is the highest. Can, you, can everyone see that? It's a little bit small. Okay. We can make this bigger. <laughs> I was going to say, if anybody does want to move further, for, uh, further forward towards the front, I was going to say this is, this is the reason why we encourage people to sort of try and fill up from the front. So, um, so round three, it reflects the number of hours you work and um, how much you are sort of compensated uh, in according to that. So, being board junior doctors working more than 56 hours per week on average, not achieving the required rest, uh, are non-compliant with the New Deal, they work excessive hours and they lack breaks, they get 100% of their basic salary on top of the basic salary, yeah? So essentially 200%. And in that way, it goes uh, down. So from band three, you come to band two, and that's divided into A and B. And again, it reflects the hours so if you're working between 48 and 56 hours, but they're mostly anti-social uh, hours, then you get 80% on top of your basic salary. If you work at 2B, again, same number of hours, but they're less anti-social, then you get 50%. A 1A banding is what most junior doctors are on now, um, and I'll, I'll come to the reason why that is. Uh, but that's where you work between 40 and 48 hours average a week, and most are antisocial. Oh God, sorry. And so you get a 50% increase uh, on top of your basic pay. And in that way, banding uh, goes further down to 1C, and then no banding where you just do your 40 hours a week and you do no uh, antisocial hours. So most of us are on a 1A banding. And the reason for that is uh, something called the European Working Time Directive. So this was fully implemented in 2009, but it did start uh, in the late 90s. And what it showed was that um, studies were done in Europe that showed that doctors, like Dr Livingston, working excessive hours was bad for the doctors and bad for the patients. Uh, it caused complications, it caused an increase in morbidity and mortality, uh, and it was um, bad for the doctor's health. So they implemented um, a rule that, uh, or a directive that stated that doctors should do less than 48 hours, uh, hours a week on average. And it also states some rest requirements. So for example, uh, it states that a minimum of 11 hours continuous rest um, should occur in every 24 hours of a uh, 24 hour period a minimum rest of 20 minutes continuous every six hours, a minimum of 28 days annual leave, and a maximum of eight hours work in each 24 hours for night workers. Now, just doing night shifts doesn't classify you as a night worker. So the European Working Time Directive was a, a welcome change in uh, contracts and in working hours for junior doctors back in 2007 to nine, and it really, then brought home the importance of not overworking your staff, of um, the importance of rest periods, um, and every hospital was uh, committed to uh, sort of uh, applying that the European Working Time Directive to their rotors. So that's sort of the sum, the overview. There's a lot to uh, salary, working hours for junior doctors, but that's just sort of the overview that. We have a basic salary and then we get banding on top according to how many hours we do that are antisocial. And to make sure that we comply currently with the European Working Time Directive, 
we have monitoring of our hours every six months or so. So two weeks out of every six months, the uh, trust will monitor our hours and make sure that we are uh, not exceeding 48 hours average a week and that we are getting the adequate rest that, we, um, that the European Working Time Directive stipulates. Okay, thank you very much for that. Um, so, the, 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 the two speakers who we've heard from um, so far, obviously, Anna has given us um, some background and context to the NHS and the reforms that are going on there. Um, and Nazi has just given us sort of an overview of the, uh, the current situation um, with regards to uh, doctors, doctors' contracts and how their remunerations uh, sort of built up. Um, our final speaker tonight is uh, Dr. Shabnam Barker. Um, Shabnam's a paediatric surgeon at Great Ormond Street Hospital, um, currently in her last few months of training before becoming a consultant. She went to medical school here in London, and since when she's worked at a number of central London tertiary hospitals. Shabnam's an active campaigner and fundraiser. She's a trustee of a charity that runs medical and surgical camps in rural, in rural Nepal, and is also an active campaigner for empowering women and women in surgery. Uh, away from work, she's also a spoken word artist and a poet. Um, I, don't think, I, I think we may have to play musical chairs um, <laughs> for, for just a moment, because I think, uh, think Shabnam wants to uh, use the slides as well. Um, Just bear with us a few moments. I suppose just while we're uh, just while we're sort of getting back online with uh, with the next presentation, um, for those of you who aren't familiar with City Circles, obviously great to see some new faces here tonight. Um, City Circles is a charity that's been around um, since 1999. Um, it was founded by graduates here in London um, who wanted to use their skills in order to start projects that would give something back to the community here in London. Um, we're now running sort of three projects. The, the Friday night talks that you're all here tonight for um, are one of those. Um, and we also run Saturday schools um, in Harrow and in West London, um, helping underprivileged children um, with their um, English and maths. And on a Sunday in Hoburn in Lincoln's Infields, um, we run a Feeding the Homeless project. Um, if you're interested in getting involved with any of those, or you just want to find out a bit more about them, um, come and speak to one of the volunteers at the end. Um, Ramiz is currently sitting at the back of the room, but there'll be a few of us around. Um, and also there's details on our website. All right, uh, Shabnam, over to you. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. <clears throat> so, um, as a surgeon, we like facts. So I'm going to give you quite a few facts about what's really been going on um, compared to what the stories are in the media. So, if you remember back in summer of last year, our Secretary of Health, Jeremy Hunt, made a public declaration, and in that he said 6,000 people or patients lost their lives every year because we do not have a seven-day NHS service. And the reason he brought that up were many, which have already been dealt with with my previous speakers as well, but he based it on a study by a gentleman called Dr. Fremantle, who is a doctor and uh, he, he does a lot of public reviews. He uh, actually had a paper which talked about uh, looking at mortality um, on a weekend basis or on a day-to-day -day basis in uh, the hospitals in this country. However, Jeremy Hunt uh, received all the information from this paper much before it was actually published. So if you see, he made the declaration in July. He got the details and the data a month before he made that declaration. That paper was submitted a month after he made that declaration to the BMJ, which is the British Medical Journal, who then uh, published it in September. Why? Well, we found out that Jeremy Hunt was one of the people who commissioned that report. We as medics have been trained in reading and statistically analysing and critically appraising scientific journals, so we got hold of this paper. Fremantle actually said 11,000 more people die each year, uh, but with, with a 30-day mortality. So they don't die on the day they're admitted to a hospital. They have an increased 30-day mortality. And that's Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday. That's not a weekend. Weekend is Saturday, Sunday. Um, 
And looking at all the details of this paper, those patients who have a higher risk of a 30-day mortality, they're, they're sick. They're going to get a higher risk of dying from their disease or their illness. And all the studies recently have shown that those people admitted on a weekend are a lot sicker than those on a weekday. If you think about your work-life balance, you kind of got a niggling pain, you're not really sure what it is. You kind of got your one weekend off, people aren't going to go and just sit in A&E unless they really have to. Um, they've also shown this with GP practices as well, when they've had increased Saturday services, those appointments aren't taken up as much as the weekday services. So you've really got to look into that. Then the authors of that paper were then questioned, and they themselves said to assume that excess deaths were caused and preventable by getting extra staff on the weekend was rash and misleading. He, um, Jeremy Hunt actually then used this very comment time and time again, <coughs> no matter what you read or the TV programs that you see or the debates in the House of Commons, everyone from David Cameron to Jeremy Hunt and everyone in the Department of Health will use this quote all the time. And I'm sorry to say, Scientifically speaking, it's incorrect and it's misleading the public. So, <clears throat> after that, they then made the proposals that actually, to cure all this, will make the uh, junior doctors work eight, seven days a week. Well, actually, we do have a seven day service, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, a fully staffed emergency medical uh, service. It's the elective service that we don't have that seven days a week. So the Department of Health, through NHS Employees, which is another governing body, then approached our union, the British Medical Association, and they said, we've got this new contract for junior doctors, there's 23 points on here looking at the working conditions, um, we uh, really like this contract, we'll negotiate point 23, but we're going to, we are going to impose the rest of the contract as it is. And by the way, even if we do negotiate point 23, we're going to impose it anyway. So the BMA then replied, well, that's not negotiation. That's just someone telling us what to do and we will not entertain this because looking at the contract, it's not fair and not safe. And we'll go into those details. So they balloted all the members. We've got 54,000 junior doctors in this country and 98% overwhelmingly voted to strike. When you don't have any other way of fighting something that's being imposed on you, you're pushed in a corner. No one really wanted to strike, but after the BMA actually have been negotiating with the government since 2013, and this is where we've come to, so we really had nowhere else to go. So after 40 years, we had the first or the, other, the next junior doctor's um, strike on the 12th of January and a further one in February. Now, I must um, uh, tell you that with these strikes, there was a fully run emergency service. So everyone who was scheduled to be on call in their departments and everyone working in A&E were all at work. It was elected, those people who were doing their elective shifts were allowed to strike. And that was at the support of every, pretty much every member of staff in their hospitals. <clears throat> Um, after the second strike on 10th of February, the government imposed the new contract, which would commence in August 2016. So, um, uh, <coughs> we've already heard very eloquently what junior doctor is and how it entails and how we become one. And I'm just going to talk to you about the proposed contract. So currently it's made up of two halves, as we've heard, we've got the basic pay and then the banding pay on top, which is not overtime or extra pay, it's, it's the contracted work, working hours that we have and according to how antisocial they are and how many weekends and nights we work. Now currently the social hours are Monday to Friday, 7am to 7pm. They want to change that, firstly, from Monday to Saturday, 7am to 10pm. I don't know if any of you have been on the tube at 8 a.m. on a Saturday morning when we're going on our way to work, but it's pretty much empty. It's not like 5 p.m. on a Thursday or Friday evening. Um, but the government also wants to remove the banding pay, which means the pay will be half of what it is, 50%. Importantly, 
the most important thing out of all of this is the removal of hospital safeguards. Those are what um, we heard about with the monitoring as well. So if a doctor is asked to work extra hours than their contract, then there are a monitor, they have somewhere to go, and the hospital will be penalised. Which means it basically telling hospitals to hire more doctors. We have trainee doctors who go along the pay scale and their training, but we also have service provision doctors. So if the trust is short, we're often asked to stay behind or work those extra weekends and those nights on top of our regular hours, which is unsafe. So the hospitals then get penalised, so then they can hire more doctors employed by the trust. Now, it was in the paper that the government said, actually, we've heard all your arguments and your doctors will give you a pay rise. It wasn't a pay rise. When they are going to remove the banding, we'll be paid 50%. Um, they then said, okay, well, why don't we increase your base pay by 11%, um, which means we're still, um, we're still, it's still a pay cut. We're just having less of a pay cut. So it's not a 50% pay cut, it's a 30% pay cut. I wouldn't call that a pay rise. You've got your half, you know, your glass half full, half empty. You can't really say a pay rise is the same as a pay cut and call it have different numbers. But importantly as well, those working less than full time and those in academic research will be severely affected. These are people who are out there working for Cancer UK, uh, looking at gene therapy. They're giving up their time. They take time out of clinical work to work in the labs and then they go and do their own calls in the evenings and the weekends to get, well, to actually cover the work and actually have a substantial salary that they can afford to look after their families and pay their mortgages. Um, they will be very much affected and they'll be put off this training. Also, they want a seven day service with the same number of doctors. Now, how do you get the same number of people who work over the five elective days to work over seven elective days? Easy. You make them work longer and you break them. So, we'll be working the new proposed timetable we're working three uh, consecutive weekends in a row with the odd day off here and there. There's erratic shifts where you'll finish at 2 a.m. at night. I think even working in East London is a bit dangerous to get to your car or there's no tube working at 2 a.m. to get you back home. So though you have, your working hours actually eat into your proposed day off, you'd be literally working and living in hospital. Um, and it's essentially asking for more hours, getting less pay, but that's not the real reason why, or the main reason why we're all fighting against this. We feel it's unsafe. We're not robots. We're human beings dealing with the lives of other human beings. So if we're not going to get that rest, we're afraid we're going to make those mistakes. Research has already been made, done in the airline industry where they've cut down the hours of airline pilots because they know with fatigue you're, you've got decreased uh, levels of awareness. Your alertness is decreased by a third when you've, got, when you've been awake for 10 hours. So if we're working longer hours, operating or dealing with severely sick patients, we don't want to get to that stage where we, we are exhausted. And that's the issue. And also, with this, we're already short-staffed as it is. We have tremendous rotor gaps at the moment. And it's worse. Since the contract was proposed, on that day in summer, there were 3,000 applications to the General Medical Council to get a certificate to work abroad. More of our doctors trained in the UK are going to move to Australia, to Canada, to America, where they're paid a lot more, they have a better work-life balance. Since that summer, we've actually got 8,000 people wanting to apply abroad. There was a journal, the Health Service Journal, looks at our working patterns and the services provided in hospitals, and they found out there are junior, junior doctors, our foundation years, the ones who work in the first two years of med after medical school, 50% of them don't go on to higher specialist training. Why? Because they've either left the country or they've given up medicine. We need to look at why that's happening. Our attention is at crisis. And currently, we are, as you've heard, the most understaffed, according to patients, in the, in the, the Western world. In the UK, we have 2.8 doctors and 8.2 nurses to 1,000 patients, which is significantly less. 
than 34 other countries in the, in the developed world. And it gets better. There was a nice guideline report um, released last year, which was hidden by the Department of Health. We found this report. And they have said that our emergency departments are severely understaffed. It's not safe. And they made strong recommendations to the government that we need to recruit more doctors, more nurses. If people are going to be disillusioned and they want to leave the country because they feel that the government are blaming them for excess deaths, they don't have faith in their doctors, who wants to stay? How are we going to actually fill all these gaps? This is just a little graph to illustrate. We've got more doctors leaving than medical students training to be doctors. So, just a very short recap. Thank you. Um, I know I like to come and work these things. But the government, so we heard from the media and from the news that there is no seven day service. That's incorrect. We work a full 24 7 emergency service. It's the elective services that work Monday to Friday. And when we mean elective, we mean, say, you need a, a knee operation or you've had a mole on your back that needs removing, but you're really well. So you get scheduled into that operation. But if you've got heart and chest pain, you're short of breath, you've got symptoms of stroke, anything like that, we urge everyone, come to the hospital on a weekend because there will be, it will be fully staffed. Um, we, they call it the weekend effect. We are worried about the hunt effect, and I'm not making this up, this is true. If you look at the latest uh, journals out there, there have been studies done since the reports in the papers about, I'm sorry to say, people waiting over the weekend and waiting to see a doctor on a Monday when they, they could have been seen on a weekend and they've suffered from strokes, from heart attacks. These are easily treatable conditions, and when they're asked why, it's because they believe the papers. Oh, sorry, I didn't think there were, and I've seen it myself. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't think there were any doctors on the weekend. Why? Because they believe what they see in the papers. It's about pay? Well, not really. We're worried about the safety of this new rotor and that it's not sustainable to make a full working service. And um, this pay rise, as I said, is not a pay rise, it's less of a pay cut than before. Um, and famously, this year, David Cameron during one of his arguments in the Houses of Parliament, said that he will not impose this junior doctor contract. On the 11th of February, it was declared that this junior doctor contract would be imposed. The government have made recommendations based on misrepresented data. Um, there's a really good video I urge you all to watch. Um, it's by the Public Accounts Committee. I don't know if you were aware of the the news about the Google, the Google uh, UK head of Google, who was um, interviewed and he couldn't really tell anyone about his salary. Well, that very committee, the Public Accounts Committee, who look at all the expenditure, asked Chris Massey from the Department of Health about their proposal for the Sunday NHS, and they said, oh, well, we need about uh, 10 billion pounds, and these are the changes, and this is what we'll do. It's one of the most embarrassing interviews I've ever seen, and it just goes to show that the government, and I don't mean to be an anarchist, but the government at the moment is making changes to our public health service uh, based on misrepresented data, um, and they've not done much work on it. It's literally been kind of theories by people who've not really spent time on the shop floor. So the future, what does this really mean? And as Dr. Livingston said as well, it's not just about the junior doctors, it's about the future of our NHS. During this time, the nurses' bursaries have all been cut. Nurses work against some of the most hardest working people and most undervalued people of the NHS. Their salary isn't that much. These student nurses often have to have extra jobs as healthcare assistants to facilitate their training. The government took their training bursaries away. We're already short of nurses. How are we going to retain this? And next is the consultant contract. It's still in negotiations. So although all three of us won't be affected by this junior doctor contract, we're fighting because it's going to affect the future doctors, the future brains of medicine that can get the best care for all of the public. But we know that it's the first step to changing the National Health Service with the nurses and the uh, consultant contracts. It's the beginning of the end 
or the beginning of the privatisation of the NHS. And just two uh, food for thoughts. We've got an increase in private fund initiatives. In last year, they spent five billion pounds of contracts went to private investors for um, healthcare. And there's something that you will start to hear of, which is called TTIPs. No one started to talk about this yet, but it's happened all over North and South America. TTIPs are where they get um, private companies to invest in government initiatives. Then they get the lawyers in, and it's all about profit. So now, those private companies uh, fund these uh, initiatives because they get profit. And if they don't get profit after the first year or two years, they are allowed to sue the government. TTIPs are at risk of actually coming across the Atlantic into our country. So we need to go back to basics. We need to go back to Nye Bevan, the founding father of our, of our NHS, who believed that healthcare should be provided equal to the, all the public. Our NHS is free at the point of need to each and every one of us, and we want to keep it that way. And if I'm allowed to just leave it on one personal note, we are so lucky in this country that when we're ill, we don't have to think about A, can we afford it, B, are we insured. We just go to our GP, we go to a &E, and we're treated as equals. One of our friends, who's a senior doc, well, junior doctor at the government size, but he's a senior doctor who's been campaigning for this as well, recently went to America. Unfortunately, he had a very bad car accident and he was in a coma. He, unfortunately, didn't take out health insurance for America. And their family cannot afford to pay for his treatment there. We, as 54,000 junior doctors, got together and raised funds to bring him back to the UK so he could get the free healthcare he deserves. So we want to keep it that way. And that's why we're here fighting for this. Thank you. OK, thank you very much there, uh, Shabnam. And obviously, lots of thoughts there on uh, lots of sort of different aspects and different facets of, um, of this. I mean, keeping up with the, the sort of wider reforms and the wider issues um, that the NHS is facing, um, and now with the, um, the sort of specifics, if you like, of the uh, junior doctors' contract and changes to that. Um, just before uh, just before I sort of open things up to the floor, there's there's one question that um, I want to pose, and um, it's something that both Anna started on and that. Um, which I haven't uh, sort of finished up with. Um, you've both stated that um, the government's um, sort of chipping away at the NHS and that they're, um, in your view, sort of trying to bring back privatisation of the NHS. But yet the government, uh, um, the Prime Minister and the government have always stated that they've got a, public, a commitment to keeping the NHS in public hands and the NHS is, um, the NHS is sort of safe in, in the government's hands. Who's lying? Who's telling the truth? Um, sorry, can I add to that? Um, a few years ago, before Jeremy Hunt became uh, Secretary of Health, he wrote a book called How to Privatise the NHS. Since um, the end of last year, it's off print, but a few of us have copies of that very report. So I, I understand, and we're all for efficiencies in the NHS, and we all know where to make those efficiencies. And um, we want it as streamlined as we can. And if it's done fairly, with all taking all our considerations on board, then by all means, we're, we're all for it. But, you know, the fundamental reason why all of us went into this, and the best thing about our country is that we have a free healthcare for all. And I don't think privatising it is the future. I think trying to get no, but, investment in making efficiencies, but, but, that's but, the way forward. But, but the question question was around whether or not the government's actually really committed to, to privatising the NHS. The, 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 the NHS the, the, the is, is, is otherwise. The, the NHS is already substantially privatised and there are a lot of weasel words here. Um, one of which is uh, what they mean. Is it just a slogan? Now you go around pharmacists. Of course pharmacists have contributions to their income from the NHS but they'll have a big slogan up saying NHS. A large number of general practices already belong to international and national companies whose salary is doctors 
and incentivise them to spend the small time with patients and um, just achieve what targets they can. Uh, in the um, southwest of England, the children's mental health services have been privatised to Virgin. Virgin actually has a whole lar a large sector, a large tranche of the NHS where it's running services. This is not exclusive to the Tories, they're just more severe. New Labour started the whole business. Private finance initiative hospitals were an idea of the Tory government between 1990 and 2000, but we were in a slump then, and big companies didn't want to start building hospitals. So it was a, a, a kick from the Blair government from 1997 onwards that actually had the private finance initiative happening. One of the things that's really sinister is that having the NHS under the Tories in around 1990 introduced something it called the purchaser provider divide. Prior to that, through the 80s and 70s, things were improving because public health was developing as a specialty in collaboration with local integration of healthcare. And many of us had a vision that we could have really well planned, efficient, effective healthcare in a district where hospitals worked with the community, where the GPs were integrated, and we could see and evaluate what was happening. There, was, there were very few staff who worked for the NHS bureaucracy, and then they divided this business into those who commission or buy healthcare and those who sell it. So we have what's called the internal market. And then over recent years, it was more separated so that hospitals had to, and, and NHS provided services had to aspire to become, um, to become trust hospitals who could go bankrupt if they weren't get, doing well. So we had all these kind of mechanisms set in, but now, not only have we had organisations like McKinsey's and other, um, uh, other consultancies, international consultancies, going through the NHS and, and um, picking out bits of it, and all, but they're also advising private companies who are commissioning the health service for the NHS. Now, public services have to be transparent but private services have to be um, kept, all their commercial secrets have to stay secret. So there's no such thing as a level playing field. Private companies are, have raked out the information. They know who they're selling to, and because it's private, it hasn't got to be public. And they're selling to their mates. And so the only thing that then becomes um, what the government is talking about is whether there's an NHS label in it, and then you could say, well, some people say, well, that's all fine if it's all privately provided as long as we get the service. But now they're limiting the lists of the things that you can get on the NHS. Among them, waiting lists are getting longer. They're talking about personal budgets, for example, personal budgets for maternity care. So if things go terribly wrong, it just runs out. They're moving healthcare into the town halls with these plans like Devo Mac where town halls budgets have been amalgamated with NHS budgets in Manchester and that's now coming to London and already sexual health has gone into the town halls. For example, in Tower Hamlets today I heard that 35% of the money from sexual health, which is contraception, sexually transmitted disease, community gynaecology, has been cut by the town hall because they've also been cut. And that these things have to be contracted out to the market and the market needs to take money, otherwise it won't go to the contract. So there's even less money for healthcare, and those who do the purchasing, many of them are privatised. So we're already down that slope, and it's only a logo, but we can stop it, and we need to stop it now, otherwise we won't have a health service. Okay, thank you very much. Right, I want to open this up to uh, questions from the floor now. Um, so if, if you've got thoughts, um, do, do raise your hands. Um, as, as always, um, please try and keep your sort of questions and points sort of as concise as possible. I mean, if, you, if you've got something that you want to say or something that you want to uh, sort of either back up or challenge any of the speakers on, um, that's, that's fine. If you can frame it in the form of a question, it just sort of helps the, uh, the flow of the discussion a little bit. Okay, yeah, lay down here. I could go on for five hours. Please, um, please, please I'll try, and try, keep try and go for about 30 seconds. Okay. Yeah. Well, there, first of all, there are a lot of errors in what was said, but the general drift I actually agree with. I qualified in 1963. I'm still working. I was thrown out of the NHS because I made the mistake of telling a patient's family, the patient was a newborn, um, that the reason for the seizures was a pace, that the baby needed a pacemaker. There's nothing wrong with the brain. 
And because the hospital, teaching hospital I was working at uh, had a six month pay, payment freeze on pacemakers, the family were told to take the baby home. Those days I thought, hmm, that's interesting. They pay their taxes to the government, not to Bath's Hospital. So I suggested that the family take the, ba the baby to Great Ormond Street and I'd arranged the letters and so on. And that was regarded as a breach of trust that my primary loyalty was to the hospital and not to the patient. And I was not prepared to sit by and see a baby die. So I went to the administrator who was 23 years old and was a nephew of one of the trust people. And that's how he got his job. Um, he got, the baby got the patient. Sorry, just in the interest of time. No, just, but so I'm trying to tell you the say, problem so question, in the NHS is not the doctors. The doctors are fantastic. They're motivated. They're well trained. I like the increased training efficiency which compared to my day. The problem is the administrators. Now there was an incorrect uh, bit of data about the, the um, what we pay per GDP is less than Europe. It isn't. It's exactly the same as Finland, but Finland has the best healthcare service in Europe. We are currently 27 out of 33 developed countries. We have slid through the ranks from my day simply because the money has gone to administrators and managers. In Finland, in, to get to be an administrator, you have a PhD and an MBA. In the NHS, you have three O levels. It's exactly the same with prison services, teaching, nursery care, whatever you like. But just as a, let's, so, let's, you know, let's, the, let's put that to the, the inefficiencies the are caused by deeply incompetent managers. Okay, and well, I can say more. Let's just put that to the panel at the moment. I mean, do, you, do you feel as though you're working in a system which is sort of administration and management top heavy? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Straightforward, yes. Everyone feels that. You know, in hospitals there's so much red tape, it's just everything is dictated by managers, uh, your working conditions, what you can do, what you can't do, it's all dictated by and how, managers. how would you change that? Um, um, okay, so I think the, one of the main issues was when the NHS uh, was first started, it was a social organisation and now it's kind of the trying to make it a profit. And I think the problem is, is when, when numbers and targets are actually patients, and patients aren't predictable. Um, though we've all been in situations where it, it's been fights, it's been, you know, clinicians do one thing and then managers want another. And actually, having I've been part of an initiative where we're trying to get clinicians and managers to work together, and it does work. I think what the problem is, is that, you know, as, as medics, as clinicians, we see this is the patient, we've got to do whatever we can to help them, fun. Whereas the managers are just told, well, you know, we're not meeting the targets for this month, and that's not correct, and this isn't correct. So they're just seeing numbers, and then they're pushed by managers and further managers as well. And I think the issue is, is that everyone needs to start working together and talking. We need to know how their targets are driven. They need to spend time with us on the shop floor and see how patients are and what we do. A prime example of this is the A and E four-hour target. Now, the trusts are penalised if 98% of their patients aren't seen and treated within four hours in A&E. &E. I was working in A&E &E when that target was first commenced and I absolutely, I'm grateful for my consultants who didn't just keep thinking right, target, target, target. The problem was, if a patient's ill, they stay in A&E until they get dealt with, I'm not going to send them back up to the wards. Three hours, three and a half hours, you get the uniform, the people in dark blue uniforms coming downstairs saying, oh, just seeing this computer, why is your patient there? You know, that's not going to look good for our trust. Why don't you just admit them onto the assessment unit? No, <laughs> because we'd rather treat that patient than get a very ill patient who's not been treated. So I think the problem is when there's targets, now things are starting to change. It's not all bad. There are managers that are that they're seeing that they need to be engaged. And there's going to be more positions for clinicians to get into managerial roles as well. There are initiatives out there, it's not enough, but that is the future. We just need to start dealing with the issues here and start talking on the same page. I think one of the issues also is that uh, as doctors, we have shied away from those roles mm -hmm. for far too long and 
part of the, the problem is, is us in that we should have been more forward and more vocal and more active from the start with, with management and administration, mm -hmm. uh, like Sharon was saying. Um, yeah. Yes, and the four hour target. And that's just one example, and that example leads to you know, you patient, you, you don't want them to breach, you don't want the trust to be fine, so you admit them a bed is now blocked with someone who probably didn't need to come in, but it does end up staying because now it's 10 o'clock at night and it's not really safe to send someone home that late. And it's just a snowball effect and that's just one issue. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Um, I'm going to sort of again invite uh, hands up sort of if anybody wants to, uh, wants to sort of chip in or if anybody's got, got ideas at this stage. Um, one thing which one thing which I wanted to pick up on was the uh, the banding which uh, you mentioned in um, I mean, I I I didn't know sort of exactly the mechanics of it, so thank you very much for for setting the tent there. Um, but I think what I was sort of surprised by is on the face of it, it does seem very generous. Um, I mean, if you're if you're talking about people who are working, I think sort of a forty to forty eight hour uh, week, um, getting a was the thirty percent. Um, well, no. it depends on your answer. Yeah, I mean, some somewhere between sort of maybe a thirty or fifty percent, um, sort of uplift on the the basic salary um, on the ground, depending upon sort of how much they're working at, at weekends and evenings. Does that seem? I, I appreciate that that's what the government's going to, or one of the things that the government's looking to change. And I appreciate that if it results in a net pay cut for people, that's going to be unpopular. But is that not only bringing things into line for sort of other people and other professions who work and social hours? It's a very controversial point um, that you're asking, and, but I'm going to say that 50% banding, um, I don't think it's unreasonable and I don't think it's generous actually, because when you see the basic uh, salaries, they, you know, as a foundation doctor it starts at less than 30000 so with a 50% banding, it's sort of 42,000, let's say. Uh, you know, at my stage, I'm final year extra, so I've completed over nine years of training, uh, and my basic salary is 40,000, and I get 20% on top, so 60,000. Now, 60,000 for your final year doctor who's done five years of med school, 10 years of training, pays for their exams, pays for their fees to the BMA, to the GMC, um, any courses that we go on, yes, we do get a study budget, but it's very limited. For all those things, all our outgoings as well, do I think it's generous to give your experienced, qualified doctor who is looking after your health 60,000? No, I don't think it's generous. Okay. Just I, I'd love to actually you know. Let's put that to the audience then. And in, in particular, I mean, is there anybody here tonight who um, works is in a professional occupation where they work um, and social hours or, or weekends themselves? Yeah? Mm -hmm. I was going to be, I'm a can, doctor. You, 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 <laughs> you're a doctor. Is, is your view sort of quite similar to, uh, to, to Nazis and the rest of the panels? Yeah, it's not the same thing. I mean, we work. One, so um, one thing that, um, one other issue about the June jobs contract right now is weekends. So right now if, you know, I work a one in four weekend uh, and that is Friday, Saturday, Sunday, 12 hour shifts, either day or night. Um, and that says, so once a month and that, that is average and, and most voters have sort of seven long days, so 8am to 8pm or seven night shifts, 8pm to 8am in, in sort of every eight weeks or so and um, for that we get 50% banding. Now one thing that the contract uh, is stating is that if people work um, less than, uh, sorry, more than one in four weekends then they will get a supplement. Now that's a very... On top of that banding? Uh, so banding is no longer exists mm -hmm. from the new contract. So for so one the new contract is just your basic salary. You do, uh, and, and hence why it is ultimately a pay cut for us. If you work a Sunday, you will get a supplement. Now, those supplements are less than what you would normally get if you worked the weekend. You will only, equally only get a supplement if you work uh, more than one in four. Now, this is an average, so it's easy for every trust to average our weekend so it's one in 3.9 as opposed to one in four. And it is really as simple as that. And 
all of us will fall into the one in three point nine weekends, and we will, none of us will get supplements. So even though the, the government is sort of it sounds like it's similar to how we're paid right now, it's not at all because there's so many loopholes to the pay. And and the other thing I want to say is that it, it is it's a little bit about pay because why why should we get a pay cut for doing the same amount of work? Who would accept that in any society, in any service? Why would you accept having a pay cut? If it improved patient outcome, fair enough. But how could a pay cut possibly improve patient outcome? But it is not just about pay. If you want to, you're trying to stretch a service to last seven days, so I do elective hips and knees on the Saturdays and Sundays, how does that help the patients other than perhaps make the, the, the list, the waiting times a little bit shorter? I, I can't see how it's actually going to improve the patient care. I think, you know, Nadia, you're yeah. absolutely correct. And I think, actually, in the short term, putting more doctors on on a weekend, we're not going to do half the stuff there. Why? Because we need the nurses, we need the lab technicians there. We, we're going to have these people just sitting there, well, actually, I, I try and do some of these things, but, you know, I can't because the porters aren't there for, to, to get the patient after they've had an anaesthetic back to the ward. Um, the cleaners, you know, we need all the other allied healthcare professionals to help. And I think actually one of the most important things as well he's saying is about being valued and appreciated. And I think everyone agrees that, you know, a successful workforce or company is where all their workers are feel that they're appreciated. And then if you're working all these hours, and dare I say, written hours are not exactly as what we practically do. I think the number of times all of us have come in an hour or two early, regularly leave an hour or two early after work, uh, late after work, we, we don't get paid overtime. We don't claim any of that money back. We're actually paying, working for free for those hours. Why? Because we care about what we do. If we've got patients who are sick, we're going to stay there and we're going to get our jobs done. Um, but also, you know, people always talk about, well, if you're going to get paid relative to the kind of the value of the work that you give, caring for someone, being in charge of someone's life, you know, we've got people who are, you know, crunch, dare I say without offending anyone, crunching numbers and looking at finance, and, you know, substantial amounts of money go to them. We're not saying take the money away from them, but why don't we feel valued as well? So we don't want a pay rise, we just, we don't want to pay cuts. That's all we're wanting for is just don't cut our pay any more than what it is. Yeah. I wanted to make a couple of other points really. Um, one of which is that the, the contract is very discriminatory against women mm -hmm. and the majority of the medical for workforce is now female because of the, uh, uh, th this question of part-time or full-time and not getting, and also in terms of maternity leave, not counting in terms of your wages going up. So I think that is going to add to the crisis in the NHS as well as being grossly unfair. But does that happen in other professions? Uh, I think that uh, it happens in some and it doesn't happen in others. But we are back into the same situation as the recession and the depression in the 1920s and 30s. We never thought we'd get into a situation where there were wage cuts across the board. And this is really not a way to have an effective service. I, don't, I think that I would defend anyone in any other profession or non-profession. And I think it isn't a question of whether you're a profession or not. We're all workers, whether we're cleaners or whether we're doctors or whatever. And we should have proper working rights, and those should include our obligations as parents to support our children and bring them up to be people who are involved in the society we're moving into. So I think that these kind of invidious comparisons are actually the kind of thing uh, that the government does in order to justify a depression of the wages of everyone working in hospital and in schools and so on, while at the same time having no hesitation in bringing in legislation which improves the profits that go to large corporations, many of which are overseas. And I feel this very strongly because I work in Tower Hamlets, one of the most unequal, probably the most unequal, I live there as well, boroughs in the country, where we look at Canary Wharf and we look at people taking the money and moving it out of the district. And we have people who just, in my surgery, when, I, when I'm seeing patients, there are people who are just sort of collapsing with poverty, they have nowhere to live, their, their health is terrible. And I don't think that as professionals, we should be treated like that. But I don't think it's to do with being professional. I think it's to do with being honourable members of society. 
Okay, thank you very much. <coughs> I was going to say, I'm, I'm very conscious that although this is supposed to be a sort of interactive, uh, interactive event and uh, interactive talk, and we seem to have, uh, everybody seems to be sort of clammy up a little bit. So, uh, yeah, as I said, we, we've got a question down here, but I'll, I'll come to you in just a moment. Uh, I have two questions. So, the first one is. Docs, obviously, when you go on strike, you don't go on full strike. And when train drivers go on strike, they go on complete strike, and everyone notices. And, well, you don't care whether you want to go on to be or not. It's not, 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 the, not the problem. Do you ever see a situation where that could happen with doctors? You know, so as a compassionate people, you probably won't, but would that, could that possibly come to a head? And the second question is, on your stats, you have some numbers around docs that are applying to leave the UK. Um, how easy is it for a doctor to leave the UK if they, they can apply to do so? But is that the next day to go somewhere or is it not? Okay, so just in case anybody didn't uh, catch all that, I think the two, the two questions or the, the two discussion points are, are going to be around is, is it 100% sort of walk out by doctors um, on the cards? And um, so what was the. How easy is it to yeah. Yeah, how, how, how easy is it um, for, for doctors to go and uh, practice abroad? We've, we've heard a lot of uh, we've heard a lot of sort of doctors applying to move the UK. Um, is that is that likely and is it possible? I can take the leaving. Um, it's interesting you raise that point because uh, a lot of my junior colleagues in when I was working. Uh, in Cambridge, I, I advised them to leave. I said that you should take your USMLEs, which are the American exams, and you should leave because this is already going. This is going to be a privatised system, the NHS. So you might as well go to an existing privatised system, which is better set up, you know, and has been going for a lot longer. And how, how many, easy? It, and you know, do you know how many of them have taken that up? I know a few of them, and that's just in the hospital I work. Already, a few have taken their exams, taken their exams, started studying. Because when you've only just finished medical school, you've got that enthusiasm and that time and that drive to study again for a whole set of exams, which I think Shabana and I feel we probably couldn't do, to be honest. Um, so, how easy is it? It's pretty easy. In terms of Australia and Canada, uh, definitely you can start working, you can apply, it takes your visa takes six months, you can start working, you do have to sit exams there as well, um, but if you've, you've only just started then it seems relatively straightforward. To go to the States, it, it is a lot harder but it's not impossible, and again that will probably take 18 months of preparation and exam taking to, to get it. But when you're 25 and thinking about how to invest your time and for your future, at this stage, it would seem very logical to invest that time in taking the American exams and migrating. Um, and with reference to your question about striking, I think firstly, no one wanted to strike. Everyone felt very uncomfortable about striking. And um, we made sure that all the people on call covered all the emergency services. And actually, everyone else was outside on the picket line. They were organising Meet the Doctors events to educate the public. They were doing life-saving courses to, as in, to teach the public. There have been lots of amazing initiatives out there. And blood drives as well, actually getting people to donate blood, and they would go in their masses to donate blood as well. There have been lots of negotiations, like talks about negotiations, and whether we do go ahead with a full all-out strike. With the initial negotiation back in December, January, there was talk after the first strike, um, then there would be an all-out strike between 8 a.m. and 5 p.m., which I don't think anyone felt comfortable about at all. Um, there are a couple more strikes due in place as well, the 48 hours coming in the next couple of months, but that's, again, we've still got uh, emergency service provision. I think if we don't get any further with this, I think the thing we're striking for now is just don't impose this contract and let's get back to talks. There are talks about having an all-out strike, <clears throat> and I don't think that's going to sit very easy with people. Um, there's also talks now... You say it's not going to sit easy with people, do you mean, do you mean within the profession? I'm talking, yeah, I'm talking about people just, uh, we as a group talk amongst ourselves. Um, social media is great, it's really helped us, I think that's how we've got where we are at the moment. But people aren't comfortable with that. And also, strike days, we don't get paid for the strike days, we declare we don't strike. And a lot of people 
can't afford to strike. We've actually set up a little charity with the BMAs because it just shows how tight money is as well. Um, as Nadia very nicely put, you know, we, we don't all that the kind of the, the figures that you saw on the PowerPoint slide. That's that's the pay. That's the gross pay as well. We don't get all that money. We have to pay a lot into our own training as well. So we are kind of and getting our, by. And our pension contributions. Oh God, yeah. So. And, I, and this sounds very nitpicky on, on pay, and, and I don't like the fact that it, June drops us all about pay. It's not, but it does make a difference on your day-to-day -day living when you feel you have one salary and you're suddenly getting a pay cut and you have mortgages. And our, contrib our pension contributions are going to go up as well with the new contract. Mm -hmm. So it means every month we are going to get less, you know? Okay. Um, the gentleman over here, um, hey, hand up, okay. um, so the junior doctors have the support of most professionals or professionals within the, med within the medical profession and research has shown they've also got the support of the wider public and it's kind of related to what you were saying in the last question but despite this of three strikes already there isn't any indication the government's going to change their mm -hmm. position so what essentially is the sort of future if this contract is imposed to sort of get it unimposed or to prevent it being imposed in general. See, I was going to say, I think this is where the public and, you know, when Rami sort of and, and Ben were say, look, is, is anyone willing to speak? Now, I'm not sure I know much, but the reason I came today is to try and uh, encourage the public to support us better in terms of um, stopping contracts. because. Jeremy Hunt and David Cameron are not listening to us. That's the, the long and short of it. Strikes, as great as maybe we feel by empowering ourselves with strikes, I'm not sure it's really moving us forward. But what we need is the support of the public. The public needs to support us and say that Jeremy Hunt is wrong. They need to write to their MPs, they need to write to their trust, they need to write to the media, they need to say why they support the NHS, why the NHS is good, the good examples of how they've been treated well. Everybody has an example or a story of something that's gone wrong in the NHS. I've heard several thousands, but I have millions more examples of how it's gone well. So that's what really I think all of us would like, is the public to support us better, more vocally than what they're doing right now. Absolutely. Write to your MPs. There's a lot of online petitions. There's 38 Degrees, an organisation which helps us with this. It's all online. It's all on social media as well. And I think, you know, power is with numbers. And I think if the public shout out as well with us, we're not the only ones speaking, then, you know, we're, we're doing this all for you. Yeah. Um, and I think, you know, I don't know how far we're going to get. I don't know how much, you know, where we're going to get with this imposition, whether it's, you know, whether we can stop it or not. But a few of us, I think the future of this as well is looking at solutions. And there, there is a group of us that we're just trying to fight something to form a cross-party coalition. I think the NHS has suffered from four-year plans for many, many years. And I think the future is trying to get a representative from each of the major political parties and get a healthcare commission. And I think if we can try and fight for this, then it might change things. But please write to your own, please. Uh, I'd like to say that I think that, first of all, in relation to all-out strike, we're effectively having an all-out strike as people gradually leave the NHS, aren't recruited, and the government makes the NHS <coughs> not a safe place to work. We've already seen statistics published that the death rate has started to go up since austerity started. I suspect that's not due to what's happening in hospitals, but due to the deprivation of people at home. But I think publicity-wise, an all-out strike can be a problem, and it is really a, a tool of last resort. But on the other hand, looking at it in terms of safety, if that were the only way of getting the government to act on the NHS, it would be a good way to do it. And we're not talking about the whole hospital walking out anyway. Um, so I think that we've, we've got to be... We've, what we've got to do, as everybody has been saying, is as a community, and I speak as a as, um, town secretary of the Keep Our NHS Public, which is a, it's three or four hundred, four hundred people on our, um, in our group, most of whom don't work in the NHS, we need to be there as a community, as teachers, as bankers, as uh, council workers and so on, and 
You're all here tonight, which is great, and it would be great if you could go back to where you're working. Junior doctors need to go out, as they've been meeting the doctors in the street, also need to be going to local schools, speaking to local union and professional association branches and so on. And there needs to be a feeling that this is our NHS that we're saving, the junior doctors are part of that. And if that it becomes a big community movement, then the government may change. And most people in Tory constituencies actually use and want the NHS. We have to remember that our Tory government are not representative. They're billionaires, most of them. They are not representative of most people who vote Tory, let alone Lib Dem, Labour, SNP, or whatever. So I think that we need to be out there. We can't, our MPs, are tied into part. We need to work with our MPs, but I think also people need to be out there and make as much public statement as they can because most of the press is also in the pockets of the government. But the more that people are out there, the more we can have a strong and powerful <coughs> campaign that can win this and more importantly than ever win a better NHS. Because as the lady said over there, Actually, things were quite bad before privatisation. You had a lot of corruption in hospitals. You had hospitals such as Bart's where you needed a special kind of male handshake to get a job. So there was the um, masonry quite apart from anything else. We wanted to be, now that I'm 63 and not uh, 21 when I started medicine, I thought we would be in a much better NHS. We do provide better care, we have better outcomes, but we, things are going downhill and we've got to stop that. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I'm sorry we're, we're out of time now. I'm, I'm aware that, uh, aware that you need to, uh, to leave shortly. Um, so thank you very much for uh, uh, thank you very much to our speakers uh, for giving up the time to, to come and speak to us this evening. And, and thank you, of course, um, for, for coming here this evening and, and sharing your thoughts and, and listening. Um, Next week, um, we're going to be, same time, same place, talking about a different topic. Um, we're going to be talking about fostering and adoption. Um, Muslims in the UK have, um, have been particularly bad or particularly weak at um, getting involved with fostering and adoption. And we're going to be looking at that sort of particularly in light of the refugee crisis, given that so many of the refugees come into the country, and particularly unaccompanied minors um, are Muslim. Um, and the benefits that they can have from being fostered in Muslim families if those are available. Um, that's same time, same place, um, next Friday evening, so here at Oliver House. Um, thank you very much again uh, to everybody, sort of both on the panel, and also on a personal note, I'd like to thank uh, Shabana Saleem, who unfortunately couldn't be here this evening, um, but um, she had a very helpful sort of briefing to me um, sort of about, the, about the topic, um, which sort of primed me, so, so thank you very much. Um, and uh, yeah, um, have a great evening, um, whatever you're doing, have a, have a great weekend, uh, whether you're working or not. Um, until next time, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.